Fired up. Ready to go. Fired up. Ready to go. As we wait for the theater to fill, I am Baritone Day Thurston on the 24th of September 2020. This is Live on Lockdown, episode 40. We are broadcasting everywhere allowed. IG Live is where I have my co-producers directing me with topics and questions to address over the next hour. Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. Uh, what's the other one? Twitch, YouTube. <laughs> what's up, y'all? And I see you, Darlene, on Periscope. Good evening. I see you, Alan, on LinkedIn. Hello, my business friend. And my IG Live people. Uh, what's up, Swiss Miss in the house? Dan Zoller, you made it to NYC. I was very happy to very happy to hear that. Dan, Dan's been out here. And Montre75 is back. Yes. Oh, it's been... It's been a week. It's been a week. But knowing that Montre 75 is with us tonight, that brings me something. That brings me a, a level of certainty. Montre is like a live streaming life raft that lets me know that this is really happening. That, that, that despite the loss of RBG and the sham of justice that occurred in Louisville, despite our president undermining the public health officials, despite us running at a rate of, I don't know, 12 cases per 100,000 and not doing much about it, but England's approaching six and they're about to do a full national lockdown, that Montre 75 is here, gives me some faith and some hope in this project called Democracy. Also, Montre's in Canada. And I'm not joking with y'all, like, I got my eye. What's the um, Zillow for nations? <laughs> So the way this show works, if you are new, I respond to you. And I've got my main camera here, my main joint, uh, running on everything but IG Live. But you, you're my people. You're my people because we started together. Started from the bottom, now we're here. Uh, I learned tonight from a great group called Civics Unplugged that Drake memes might save us all. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to let y'all show up for a few more beats. And uh, I have some things that I would like to talk about. Some things happening in Louisville. New York Times, with all their mad resources, can't even pronounce the name of the town. It's not Louisville. It's Louisville. Right? You say it like you're swirling some bourbon in your palate. Because you probably are. <laughs> Speaking of which, to the good people of Louisville, we are with you. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about election season, not election night. We're going to talk about the call to arms for folks who think they might lose. What are they so afraid of? And uh, we're going to talk about whatever you want to talk about. So let me do a check-in, see who's here. I recognize some of my familiars, Mark McIntosh. In the house. Love you, brother. Thank you for being here, Eric Telford. I see you before vegan was cool. That's how I know this is a real show. And uh, Vicky Velcro. It makes me think of uh, that Batman song that Prince made with Vicky Vale. Vicky Vale. But Vicky Velcro. Um, and I'm, you know what I'm doing. I'm looking for my favorite uh, username of the night. But I got to give a shout out to my sis, Lena Way. Thank you for joining us in the room tonight. Uh, we had a pop in from Lena a few weeks ago or months ago or years ago. What is time? I have a little TARDIS right out, out the shot. Time Lords, I need you right now because <laughs> you all we got. Thank you for showing up, Lena. Um, Hungry Ben. You know what, Ben? I like your username. It communicates a lot about you. And in the moment that we're in, I'm going to infer things at you. Ben is hungry, but not for food. Ben is hungry for the nourishment of quality information and a commons we can believe in. 
Ben is my uncle, but not in that shady way. Ben is my relative because no matter how far away, he is part of me and I am part of him. And who knows if he is even a him. I made a presumption, maybe too far. Ben, you are welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Hungry Ben, you are the username of the night. It also makes me think of Bob's big boy. I'm also mad hungry right now. And in 58 minutes, I'm a bounce <laughs> because I got to get some dinner. I did three live streams in a row today. You're number four. You're my road dogs. Yay. So let's get into it. If you're on my IG fam, um, hit the question mark at the bottom. I'll check in with these topics every now and then. And uh, to the folks on everywhere else, uh, I see you. I see you very much. Bethany, thank you. Uh, Shalitha, yo, that's a dope name. Thank you for being here. Um, let's go to Louisville. Let's do it. So, I'm struck by a few things in this city of Ali of a man who stood so strongly for we, not just me. We have an opportunity here and it's not wasted. Some things have shifted. We have tasted what justice could feel like, but we have also been dealt a serious blow. We are reeling like, what was that all about? And we knew, if you pay attention like I do, you knew that this was not gonna be all right because they started locking down that city. They erected barricades in the street like we were in Les Mis. You feel me? They knew this wasn't gonna go down right. They knew they weren't right. So they blocked the streets, all right? They paid out the family first, $12 million. That's the price of a black life. And when it came time for the grand jury to do its thing, for the prosecutor to do his thing, they updated the story. And I got to be honest with you, some of the initial information I got was not right. Brianna wasn't asleep. Her boyfriend said so himself. So let us accept some of those facts and not move the position on the shelf. It's still very unjust. That's the label on this bookshelf because... This moment became bigger than a woman named Brianna, a woman who put her life on the line in a voluntary status to be an EMT during a pandemic. That means she stood for we, not me. But she wasn't asleep. She was wide awake. When those officers banged at the gate but still didn't identify that they were officers of the peace, they brought war to her front door and her boyfriend stood his ground. Which apparently black people can't do. You know if his color was blue or white, which by the sights of this so-called republic are the same, that we would be shouting his name as a hero. But no, they try to frame him up. They try to take her ex-boyfriend, line him up against her. They concealed information for months that they had, and they let us believe a lie, which is itself an act of lying. They could have cleared this up much sooner, y'all, and they didn't because it served somebody not to do that. So, some of the information we got early on was not accurate. That happens. I own that. I accept that. but there were still lies in this story. If the family hadn't advocated, if people hadn't been in the street for 119 days, we wouldn't even know her name. I am so tired of this. I can almost not continue this. But I'm not talking to you right now. I am feeling what comes to me through me right now. Back in the 1850s, 
1860s, 1870s. A subset of Americans learned about this practice in Europe called tipping. It existed there as an addition to the wages that people learned on top of their job. It was a sign of refinement. But when it reached these shores, we interpreted it differently. Slavery was just coming to an end, but not for all of us. People in the restaurant industry said, okay, we will continue to employ, if you can call it that, these black women but we ain't paying them. We'll let the customers pick that up. They will tip. Tips wages were reserved for a certain class of Americans, black Americans, heavily black women Americans, because they didn't value them. And we still, in so many ways, don't. It doesn't matter what they do. We expect them to get black and blue for all of us. And Brianna came to represent that struggle. This could have happened differently, y'all. Remember the care that they took to lock down downtown, to barricade the streets, to board the businesses, to call back the police from their vacations. They took every step. Remember the steps they took to lie about the ex-boyfriend, to update the warrants. Remember the steps they took to protect themselves, but not Brianna. <laughs> it's never for Brianna. Maybe posthumously, and even now, no. In this indictment, in this charge against one of three, they don't even mention her name. Walls give more protection than a human life. And all that energy they invested in protecting the businesses of downtown, they refused, they refused to charge anybody else. And I'm gonna try to keep it as real as I can with you. I don't know the laws of the great state of Kentucky. It could very well be that it is difficult to bring a case to officers of the peace who bring war to the doorsteps of this couple once they are fired upon. Could be difficult, could be difficult. But where is that difficulty when it comes to <laughs> to the black kid jaywalking. Where is that difficulty when it comes to the immigrant trying to come to this country? Where is that difficulty when it comes to three strikes for possession of marijuana? Where is the difficulty? Because it seems to me like they find all the excuses they need to throw the book at us. But when it comes to these blue lives and these white lives, which are basically the same, now they want to invoke the rule of law. You can't be a nation of laws if the laws only apply to certain people. You can't be a nation of laws if you only use those laws to protect certain people. It's a sham and we see right through it. You don't invoke the Constitution when it's convenient to do it. It's all of us or it's none of us. and they're never willing to sacrifice themselves. They knew things would pop off in these streets or else why lock them down? They throw the book at a child. They kidnap a child. But when it would actually increase public safety, they won't prosecute a man if he has that badge. Maybe if they charged these men, they would have lost that case. It happened in Baltimore, it's true. But it would have demonstrated that they care. With everything that's happened, they still don't get it. We need to see that you care. We gave you an opportunity to show that you care. And you squander it again and again and again, not just in this lifetime, but the 10 generations that came before now. 
And then you call us the looters and the rioters. That's a nice trick. I'm with you, Louisville. We've gotten through this before and we will do it still. I want to read something to y'all. I got tipped off to an article in the Atlantic. You know, I get three articles a month and I'm decently paid, but I can't pay all these outlets. You know, I got the Washington Post on the payroll. I got the LA Times. I think I'm kicking money to Wikipedia this month, ProPublica, the Texas Tribune. I'm just like, yo, journalism, but like everywhere, but not everywhere because there's an upper limit because there's all these streaming services too, except Quibi. I canceled that Quibi because I don't think that's a real thing. Unless they're going to give me a show, in which case I believe in you, Quibi. So anyway, in my allotment from the Atlantic, I came across this article. What did they call it? Uh, the election that could break America. Subtle. <laughs> it's 44 minutes according to Pocket. <laughs> I ain't reading for 44 minutes. But I will share the first few graphs. Graphs is what you call a paragraph if you have a pseudo journalistic background like such as myself. Here we go. Let me shift the eye line a little bit, just a little bit. There we go, I saw a little closer to you. The danger is not merely that the 2020 election will bring discord. Those who fear something worse take turbulence and controversy for granted. Am I right? Also, I'm annotating this. The coronavirus pandemic, a reckless incumbent, a deluge of mail-in ballots, a vandalized post office, a resurgent effort to suppress votes, and a train load of lawsuits are bearing down on the nation's creaky electoral machinery. I mean, tell me why you mad, Atlantic. Something has to give. And many things will, when the time comes for casting, canvassing, and certifying the ballots. Anything is possible, including a landslide that leaves no doubt on election night. I've been on this for months. Let us leave no doubt. Let us landslide it. Landslide, put it down. Let's do that one. But even if one side takes a commanding early lead, tabulation and litigation of the overtime count, millions of mail-in and provisional ballots could keep the outcome unsettled for days or weeks. If we are lucky, this fraught and dysfunctional election cycle will reach a conventional stopping point in time to meet crucial deadlines in December and January. The contest will be decided with sufficient authority that the losing candidate will be forced to yield. I like words like yield. It makes me think of like uh, sword fighting and other medieval type shit. Do you yield, sir? I yield. Collectively, we will have made our choice. A messy one, no doubt, but clear enough to arm the president-elect with a mandate to govern. As a nation, we have never failed to clear that bar. Woo, I was like, I mean, I was around for 2000, but apparently... But in this election year of plague and recession, first of all, notice they upgraded pandemic to plague points for the Atlantic. In this election year of plague and recession and catastrophized politics, the mechanisms of decision are at meaningful risk of breaking down. Yo, this is a good writer. I just, I'm popping back in because I like the flow of these words. I think maybe I'm putting a little sauce on it, but you know, I'm gonna give credit to the writer. Close students of election law and procedure are warning that conditions are ripe for a constitutional crisis that would leave the nation without an authoritative result. We have no fail safe against that calamity. Thus, the blinking red lights. Quote, we could see a protracted post-election struggle in the courts and the streets if the results are close, says Richard L. Hasten, a professor at UC Irvine School of Law and the author of a recent book called Election Meltdown. Quote, the kind of election meltdown we could see would be much worse than 2000's Bush v. Gore case. And that was terrible. That's me, the, the terrible part. Richard didn't say that. A lot of people, including Joe Biden, the Democratic Party nominee, I like how they, met, they identified, like, we don't know Uncle Joe. We've been rolling with Joe. 
People, including Joe Biden, have misconceived the nature of the threat. Pray tell more. They frame it as a concern, unthinkable for presidents past, that Trump might refuse to vacate the Oval Office if he loses. They generally conclude, as Biden has, that in the event of proper, uh, in that event, proper authorities will escort him from the White House with great dispatch. Again, that's some old timey language. Dispatch. I mean, who talks like that? I feel like I'm in a episode of Deadwood or something. And yo, that's some that's some dope writing. I kind of want to write a show like Deadwood, but just with like more black people. The worst case, however, is not that Trump rejects the election outcome. The worst case is that he uses his power to prevent a decisive outcome against him. If Trump sheds all restraints and if his Republican allies play the parts he assigns them, which we know they will, he could obstruct the emergence of a legally unambiguous victory for Biden in the Electoral College and then in Congress. He could prevent the formation of consensus about whether there is any outcome at all. He could seize on that uncertainty to hold on to power. Trump's state and national legal teams have already laid the groundwork for post-election maneuvers that would circumvent the result of vote counts in battleground states. Ambiguities in the Constitution and logic bombs in the Electoral Count Act make it possible to extend the dispute all the way to Inauguration Day, which would bring the nation to a precipice. And here I am thinking, we already had a precipice. And they're like, no, there's precipices within the precipice. Yo, I heard you like precipices, so I put a precipice inside your precipice. The 20th Amendment is crystal clear that the president's term in office shall end at noon on January 20, but two men could show up to be sworn in. One of them would arrive with all the tools and power of the presidency already in hand. Julian Zelizer, a Princeton professor of history and public affairs, said, we are not prepared for this at all. We talk about it, some worry about it, and we imagine what it would be, but few people have actual answers to what happens if the machinery of democracy is used to prevent a legitimate resolution of the election. I'm going to stop there. Like I said, it's a long article, but you get the gist. This is not election night. It's election season. And some of us are not ready. So I share that to help psychologically prepare us for what might happen. I share that to encourage us to take action today to prevent that from happening. What would help? An unambiguous early result that silences this damn fool and his co-conspirators. I shared a lot of my thoughts about the Republican Party. They don't exist in any, any legitimate sense in our democracy right now. They have remained silent at best in the face of authoritarianism. They have colluded Vichy-like explicitly with it. That brings me to RGB. May she rest in peace, our supreme justice of the court. There's a lot could be said, but instead I'll share what I think matters most to me right now. I expect shameless hypocrisy from Mitch McConnell. I, I expect that. Her body was still warm when he declared we gonna replace that seat with one of our lackeys. But the people who have signed up for this, the people who have tried to buy this, the people who at a very high price are willing to make us pay for the outcome they want. They want to run the courts. They want to overturn Roe v. Wade. They want to assume command and control of the law of the land. What makes you think the laws will stand given how you achieve this? It is paradoxical. It is oxymoronic to assume controls of a democracy by undermining that democracy and then expect to rule. Why do you think this fool will listen to you? He doesn't care about anybody but himself. So you get control of the courts. What good is the court when he's willing to undermine it? 
It's the epitome of short-term thinking. I'm appealing to your selfishness. I get you don't like some of the way this works, but you don't get it to work by breaking it. You're not in charge. He wants it that way. He's using you to get his way. If you run around with this label of pro-life, part of me understands it. Part of me can't stand it. Mitch McConnell is a very effective legislator when he wants to be. He can run the Senate like a pimp runs his coterie when he wants to. So he's decided he wants to. He's going to break the record for confirming a justice. Never, never been done before. He's trying to get in the Guinness book. He set his eyes on an ill-gotten prize and he's going to claim it. So we'll see. He'll probably be able to get it done. But I want us to remember what he's not doing. The pandemic isn't over just because you're over it. We're still in this thing. 1,091 people died in the past 24 hours. And this fool don't care. He's willing to move mountains to do something that's never been done before, to install a sham position on a soon-to-be sham court, to rule over an unrulable, unlawful nation. But he won't move an inch to actually save your life, Mr. Pro-Life. And if you call yourself pro-life, I got a simple question for you. As we are past the precipice of two 100,000 dead who don't need to be. How many people have to die for you to still call yourself pro-life? How much blood do you need on your hands for you to call yourself pro-life? Because to save lives right now, we don't need to overturn some massive precedent. We don't need to undermine Senate rules and procedures. We just need you to stay your ass at home and put on a damn mask. Ain't nobody asking you to storm the beaches of Normandy. We're asking you to stay six, way, six feet away from me to protect all of we. That's it, that's it. It's like on the list of things I could ask you to do to demonstrate your commitment to pro-life is that too easy for you? You need a fight? Or is it <laughs> that you don't actually give a damn? That you wrap yourself in the sham of an exclusive rights to our flag? Maybe that's it. If you're willing to do this dirt, you don't believe the things you've been saying you believe this whole time. Mitch McConnell could save lives, could have saved lives, will not move quickly to accelerate a relief bill right now. Could do it. Won't. Won't. So spare me the I vote my conscience. <laughs> I don't think you know what that word means. Respectfully. There's one more thing on my mind and then I'm gonna check in with you. Almost two weeks ago, a member of this administration was forced to take a leave from his job. He went on Facebook live that global surveillance marketing monster and democracy undermining birthday reminder service. And he told the people this. He told our president's people this. 
if the election results say that we haven't won, I need you to take to the streets with your guns. He did that. And he did that. The guy who carries the water for law and order ordered illegal acts and chaos. There is a circle that they have broken. Let me attempt to unbreak it for us. A lot of people are now here cosplaying that they care about rights, and freedom, and life, and liberty, that they fear a tyrannical government taking over, jackbooted thugs storming into our homes, killing us in the very thresholds of our property, which we have a right to. They haven't lifted a finger or a thumb in defense of the rights of people in these streets exercising their First Amendment. Because maybe they don't believe the things they say. This dude encouraged armed insurrection in response to a failed election result. That's not patriotism, yo. We have tools, procedures, venues to be heard, to use your power. If you pick up a gun and results, if you pick up a gun in response to an election result you don't like, it's not patriotism. It makes you a coward. It makes you weak. And of all the people and all the land to declare that they are going to stand with their weapons in response to a democratic election, literally the last people on that list should be a heterosexual white man. Of all the people who could claim that the government has overreached the last people who could preach to me about freedom is the person for who this whole system was designed to confer excess freedom. You gonna take to the streets with your AR-15s before anything even happens? It's a presumptive rebellion? <laughs> Come on now, really? At least wait for the price of tea to get jacked up before you dump it into the harbor. Oh, well, they, they might jack up the price of tea, so I gotta get rid of this stuff now. So are you just boycotting stuff before the company disappoints you? You just raiding stuff before the officials disappoint you? Come on now, you, you really, you that weak? There's a word for people like you. I think you use it too often. Snowflake, how dare you? How dare you invoke the language of freedom and rebellion and rights? How dare you strap up to fight the government designed for you? Come on now, really? We ain't, we ain't, this is not, no, no. You don't get to do that. Take a number behind black people. Take a number behind indigenous people. Take a number behind every woman who ever lived. If there's anybody that's got a right to talk about revolution, you are last on the list. This whole shit was built in your name for you. How dare you? Well, I hear they might be demanding equal rights for not me. Get the strap. <laughs> You little snowflake, are you for real? That's how tiny, that's how small, that's how weak you are? Come on now. You're a joke. Your revolution is an insult to the word. Read your own history. <laughs> Even your slave owning predecessors faced a real threat. King George was real. He actually did things. But you imagining that Joe Biden's going to do something? Give him a chance to disappoint you. 
And then we could talk through all these tools you set up. Courts, money, free speech, assembly. <laughs> it's almost like you don't believe in the system that was designed for you. Now, ain't that some shit? Waving a flag you don't even understand? To quote you, at you, if you don't like this country, then leave. Okay, it's been a day, it's been a week, it's been a year, it's been a millennium, it's been real. Love to you, love to you. Let me check in with you. <sighs> Before vegan was cool says, might I suggest jackfruit tacos for dinner? Yes, you may. Yes, you may. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Marielle Fontaine asked for something light. What good is in your glass? We've got bullet bourbon, old stout, 47. Equal parts, orange Angostura bitters, and a small wedge of nearly stale orange that I have preserved far too long in my refrigerator. Plus a big old ice cube in a glass with the name of my high school on it. I love drinking liquor out of a high school glass. Thank you for that, Mario. What else we got? Estrella Negra 83, or is it Estrella Negra 83, says, do we have a chance? Do you honestly think this country has a chance, regardless of who's in office? Well, thank you for the softball. <laughs> There's always a chance. I wouldn't... Uh, Spent the past 40 minutes exhaling uh, so violently at you if I didn't think there was a chance. Otherwise, I'd be wasting my time and I would just bounce. Not ready to do that. We have a chance. We've had chances before. We've taken them. I got to join an event today from my agency, CAA, uh, Creative Artist Agency. I do this thing called Amplify. It was a great program. Kerry Washington was there handling it. <laughs> Sherilyn Eiffel was there and I'd literally do whatever Sherilyn Eiffel at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund tells me. Like if Sherilyn Eiffel was like, clean my bathroom. I'm like, yes, ma'am. Clearly this benefits black people. So I learned a lot from folks who are in different parts of this struggle. Uh, John Meacham was there presidential historian. I've seen him on MSNBC a lot. But he was like, real, real. Like, this was like, woke John Meacham in a different sense. And he said this election um, reminds him of the 1850s. And you know what happened right after the 1850s. It's the Civil War. I know we have a terrible education system in this country, so you might, it's the Civil War. And um, he said, you know, it's, uh, it's John Lewis versus Bull Connor in terms of the worldview that's on the ballot right now. And he, he has had conversations with John Lewis across his life. And he said, John believed in people in a way that I don't. He described the Constitution as a Calvinist document. I mean, first of all, I had to Google that. 
and I consider myself knowledgeable, but I don't know everything. So it's like this religious lens about basically not trusting the good nature of humans. And so you set up a system to pit nature against nature, to use ambition divided across different institutions, legislative, executive, judicial, and through that competitive process sort of move us all forward. So it is really smart. It is really brilliant. And it's built out of a lack of faith in humanity, actually, which I find really interesting. That's not the way I was taught um, our system of government. Why am I telling you all this? Uh, I don't know. Some of me said it's important. But in the matter of chances that we might have for this country, oof. We've been at this moment in some ways before. It has not always been resolved peacefully. Civil war happened and it never really ended. I mean, people put down their guns and we said we were one nation, but some people never let it go. And they invented a fiction of Confederate statues to prolong the battle. And we all sustained the system of white supremacy to prolong the battle. But we did escape some version of it and we made a lot of progress in the process. Like I'm alive and I own this water bottle. <laughs> Hydro flask, you are progress. And I'm literally clinging to you as evidence that we're not in the 1850s anymore. And I can vote and it has been counted. I've checked. And we have suffrage and we have world wars, several of them. And we had the 60s and 68 and Meacham reminded us of 68, 55% of the country, I think he said, voted for Nixon or the other one, the other super racist guy. I can't even remember his name, it's in my notes. I'm not going there right now. Hit, it, hit me up in the chat, correct me, help me. Let's make it together. So we're always on some edge. And this is different. Um, because, <laughs> here's the other thing he said. I think, I think we need to remember this. Before the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act, we lived in legal apartheid. We did not live in democracy. We are not the world's oldest democracy. Our democracy at best kicked off in 1965, and that's being generous. I still don't know if it exists in the state of Florida. Florida, come. If you got some spare money, throw it at the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition. That's a, that's a sponsored post. <laughs> So all this, Meacham brings the historical lens to my mind today and I share it with you in this way because it partially answers, do we have a chance? We of course have a chance. Part of the genius of our system is the intentional distrust and creation of competing interests to arrive at a better place. Another part of the genius that Meacham reminded me of today is the built-in work in progress. You remember the early internet? I'm old, I'm 42. I remember the early internet. And it was like, there was, it wasn't owned all by Mark Zuckerberg. It was like an actual internet, not this like wall garden of exploitation and selling myself back to myself. And I say that with love. Some of my best friends are on Facebook, <laughs> including me. So, um, Early internet, everybody was just building a web page. And we all felt the need to add this little animated GIF. And it is not GIF. It is GIF. It is graphic, not graphic. I will fight you. I will actually fight you. And I need to burn off some energy. So we can set a time and a place and I will mask up and we will fight. It is GIF and not GIF. You feel me? So we all felt the need to install these animated GIFs on our page that said, under construction and it was like a little silhouetted human doing this that's all of us 
in these United States. We're under construction. We are a work in progress. We are upgradable. We're iOS. And we're always applying security patches and adding new features and including more people in the operating system that is our democracy. That truly is brilliant. I've got mad complaints. I have a decent amount of hate for this land that I also love because it's amendable and that is commendable. And we must use that power to continue on this journey of becoming not actual, but more perfect. We have a chance. The chance is baked in. And that brings me back to my boy, Mitch. Get Mitch a die trying. I gave money to that crooked media fund. If you got spare money, give to the Give Mitch Fund. It's distributed to very winnable Senate races because we have to make several cases in this election that this is not just about the former online sake salesman and womanizer with the jacked up hair. This is about all of us who care about the Republic. This ain't right versus left, it's right versus wrong. So we gotta send a signal with a gong of overwhelming results that punish not just the man who offends us all, but the party that makes it possible. And that means we get Mitch. And that means let them do what they purport to do to this Supreme Court. It's cool. It's amendable and that's commendable and we can change the very definition of that court. So go ahead, Mitch. Do your thing. Do whatever the Koch brothers and Sheldon Adelstein have paid you to do. Oh, I, I recognize that too. Thank you, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, who came on Rachel Maddow earlier this week and broke that down for me. It's not just that the man has no soul, it's that his soul is under the control of people with deep pockets. So it actually kind of makes sense, or should I say dollars, many, many millions of them. So you do what you gotta do, and you remind us all of what we gotta do. We're gonna take this White House back. We're gonna put this Senate on track. We're gonna keep this house in order and we are gonna clean up this filthy, filthy mess. Expand the court. Great. You got your two stolen seats, we will nullify that with feats of democracy. Boom! I mean, it's right there, it's right there. So I get very um, angry. <laughs> I get very annoyed. I'm like, but what about and how dare you? It's all true. We have a chance. It's up to us to take it. So you're spending a lot of time with me right now and my ego appreciates the feedback. <laughs> you know, I like seeing the hearts fly and the comments scroll and yeah, it's all good. Whatever amount of time you're spending here, you spend it in your community. You understand your ballot. You study for the test and you be ready. You vote up and down. You do not assume your friends have it all figured out. You figure it out with them. You divide and conquer this electoral opportunity with the same gusto but opposite spirit that the Europeans divided and conquered this globe. You wrest control back. It's power to the people and that is not a 60s song. That is the refrain of our republic. That's what democracy is. Show that you believe in it. Claim your piece of it. Don't let them make you doubt it. Because then they win. And Putin wins. I mean, do we really want to work for Vladimir? I do not believe we do. I do not believe we do. Let me check back in with you. All right. 
Vicky Velcro asked for a critter update. I appreciate you, Vicky. Uh, we're switching gears for a minute, so I've been checking my surveillance footage with my cameras. And I can say I haven't seen a raccoon in a number of days. We had this gang of raccoons that was rolling through four deep every night, wrestling in these streets, and I, I can't find them. The um, possum have uh, procreated. <laughs> There's a little adorable baby possum running around, and I'm like, oh, you're hideous, but you're cute. How can you be adorable and cute at the same damn time? You need your own song. So that's cool. The skunks are back in full force. The neighborhood cats, they never left. They are the constant through all of this. And, uh, you know, we got these squirrels. We, what can I say? They are living their best lives. They, the avocado tree is producing enough fruit for us to eat and for them to get loose. And so I'm not even mad at them anymore. It's just fun to watch the sexual acrobatics out my window of these squirrels as, uh, as they get their feast on. So thank you for asking on that. Uh, let's see, let's see what else we got. And uh, let's see. Oh, I love to see you talking to each other. This is beautiful. This is beautiful. Oh, Jillian says, the past few weeks I found your streams to be a bastion of sanity in the deep murk. That's pretty cool. That's a good use of language. You could write for the Atlantic. All right, we got like eight minutes-ish left. Let's see, let's see. Was there something else I was supposed to talk about on my list? All right, let me check the bucket one more time for my IG people. I can't read this one. How do we convince people to do something other than say her name? Nikki says, how do we convince people to do something other than say her name in terms of Breonna Taylor? Uh, it's an overwhelming moment and we all been asked to do a various things like support this bail fund and use this hashtag and defund the police and call the city council and vote up and down the ballot. And, and we have to do all of it. We don't all have to do everything. And so I, I think I'm coming around to this place where you and your circle of people, could be your family, could be your friends, could be your coworkers that you're trapped in a Zoom loop with, split up the tasks. There's enough work to go around. Uh, that's that's kind of how we set the system up. And, and, and it's going to be the long haul. You know, this system was established a long time ago. So they've gotten some reps in. And we've, it's going to take us some time to uh, do it differently and do it better. So in terms of convincing people to do more, I think it also helps to remind people of victories. And this is an opportunity for me to shout out my podcast. 50 something minutes into my own show. Let me talk about the other show. How to Citizen with Baratunde. It's available where podcasts are found. And... Uh, I was reminded today of a, of a victory of sorts in a place that started off this most recent version of activation, city of Minneapolis. We had Dr. Phil Goff on the show, a uh, representative of, founder of a group called the Center for Policing Equity. In the same episode with Zach Norris, who runs the Ella Baker Center out of Oakland, California. And they both shared some good news. California stopped building youth prisons. We've reduced the population. We shut down youth prisons in the state of California. And youth crime did not increase as a result. We ended some injustice and replaced it with more justice and maintained public safety in the process. And in Minneapolis, they changed the way we respond to victims of sexual assault. And the way Phil put it, I'm paraphrasing, but we have men with guns showing up to interview victims of sexual assault long after the threat has passed, and that is re-traumatizing. We don't have to do it that way. So they've got this program, don't remember exact name, some kind of ambassador program, and they basically have trained counselors talk to these primarily women, but not always, who are post this traumatic stress event. That's better. 
And that is the, the holistic, humanistic version of what defund the police even means. What public safety could look and feel like when you don't just sick unaccountable people with firearms onto every damn scene. It's very not creative. We can do a lot better. So as we try to expand and roll more people into the process, remind them of what it looks like on the other side. It's not just wanton anarchy. We're kind of living in a version of that right now in Donald Trump's America. It's more accountability and it's putting the most talented people in the positions they need to be in. So thank you for the question. All right, let me go back to the grab bag. Ooh, yes, 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 I will. This is great. I'm, I'm about to cry. I love this man. Senator Gustavo Rivera from the great state, the empire state of New York, representing the Bronx, the boogie down, the BX, asked, will I toast with him? Brother, I will. To you, to me, to us, which is we, I salute you. Ah, oh, we had Gustavo on the show. Feels like eons ago in the live on lockdown version right here on IG, I believe. It's hard to keep all these platforms straight. Um, it's good to see you. And it's also good to see, let me... Um, let me express some love and solidarity with my people of New York City. I've had a very New York week, even though I'm here in Los Angeles and I don't sleep in that beautiful city on a regular basis anymore. But I still serve formally on the Board of Trustees for Brooklyn Public Library. I was put there by the mayor, the mayor I love to criticize. But thank you, homie. And I, you know, helped me reconnect. And then I listened to my man, Dr. Michael Osterholm, Check out his podcast for all things COVID. I see the floor to you anytime, brother. And he talked about what New York shows, that they're still below one case per 100,000. They have managed to suppress this virus after taking a hit for all of us. New York took one for the team and lost a lot of people, lost a lot of our people. And I mean that in so many different ways. But those ICU folks learned things and they shared it through their networks. And now our mortality rate is lower because New York learned a lesson on behalf of us all. And I got my issues with hashtag crisis daddy Cuomo on all sorts of things, trying to defund Medicaid in the middle of a pandemic. Not stepping up to the case where we could redirect funds around policing, where we could stop the carceral punishment system. You can do better, Cuomo. But... Thank you for what you have done with this pandemic. And the beauty of these two people I just named is they work together. That's, that's part of it. In the absence of federal leadership, some people of the states in our federalized system have stepped up. And if you look on a regional basis at the states that are doing best right now, they have something in common. They are states like Maine, New York, Rhode Island, Vermont. What is it about those states? They are the first colonies. They are the original U.S. Americans. And they are showing us a way to rebuild our republic in this pandemic stage. So ignore the nonsense, man, and make a plan to remove him from office, from power, and from the power we give him through our attention, there are still people doing a good job. There are still people trying to live up to these founding documents that even the founders didn't do themselves. Toast to you, Gustavo Rivera, and the people of the Bronx and New York City and New York State, New England. Yeah. Yeah, I want to do some jazz hands for you. All right, all right, all right. We're running out of time. I uh, I am uh, so Pisces. <laughs> so I love this name. I love, you're not Hungry Ben. Hungry Ben wins tonight. But I am so Pisces says, are there any show, movie, or documentary recommendations? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm still high off of Hentified on Netflix. Highly recommend that. Right now, I, <laughs> I've been really enjoying the show. We just started binging it last night. Ted Lasso on Apple TV. Like I said, too many services. With Jason Sudeikis. This show is so joyful. I realize there's a formula to get me to watch your show. This is basically Friday Night Light goes to England. It's got underdogs. It's full of heart. He doesn't say like clear eyes full hearts can't lose, but he says it, you know what I'm saying? Like in his heart as his character. And I'm a sucker for some level of like cheesy, we shall overcome good times kind of thing. And it's in England, which I have a very mixed relationship with because I visited those fools three years ago and I loved it. But also, what a bunch of savages. If you ever go to the Tower of London, it's real Game of Thrones. They murdered their nephews and their cousins. That is not anything to emulate, you know what I'm saying? So I'm glad we deviated from them a little bit. Uh, but also, even Bojo is doing better with this than our head of state. So, peace, England. Uh, so I, I really have enjoyed that show. Uh, and there's another one, uh, The Night Manager. I was really digging the nine manager. Haven't checked out the social dilemma. Seen a lot of comments about it. Uh, my friend Ryan Akumra wrote a, a great piece over at is it Technocracy? I put it on my LinkedIn <laughs> and I'll tweet it out too and Facebook it and you know feed the freaking machines. But I uh, align with her criticism even if I haven't seen it yet, which is like it's just a bunch of white dudes in this film criticizing the stuff a bunch of white dudes created without tapping into any of the voices of women of people of color who suffered most under their woefully uh, blind creation of monstrosity. And, and I want to give a shout out to, I'll probably close with this. Let me find, uh, there's a, a late night writer and uh, what's her name? What's her name? Going through my text messages because I sent it. Rachel Winitsky. Greatest tweet of the week, by far. Um, let me just give you, I want you to be able to find this. So I am clicking all kinds of links, opening new browsers, taxing my processor. Ooh, Papa needs a new computer. Uh, but loading, loading, Firefox is loading. Thank you. This uh, segment brought to you by Firefox. We're loading. Oh, it's just her name. Rachel, R-A-C-H-E-L, Wenitsky, W-E-N-I-T-S-K-Y. She posted this tweet, a former tech employee in a documentary about why social media is bad. It's a minute and 12 seconds that you will not want to get back. You'll want to give more and put it on a loop. It's so funny. It's so great. It is why we have comedy and satire. Uh, so thank you, Rachel. You, you did your thing. And um, that's, I recommend you watch that. You probably, you know, if you don't have the time, don't watch The Social Dilemma. If you listen to me, you probably know all the stuff I've written about it. Ryan has written about it. Nilla for Merchants written about it. Dana Boyd's written about it. You know, so like to listen to a bunch of people who created it and then got rich and then decided it was wrong. I understand the critique. I also welcome them to the fold. You know, I'm not going to say I wish they didn't do it, but you know, it's, it's like the fire festival. Basically, it's the fire festival for social media. It's that Hulu documentary, whatever, where they like colluded with the people who created the Fire Festival to criticize the Fire Festival. It's like, yeah, but you did it. You made the the fest, the non festival. That was you. Whatever that agency was, F Jerry. Like, you don't get to be in a documentary about how you. So you know, they, these things just need to come with a disclaimer. That you know, uh, people you see in this uh, documentary may also be responsible for the things that they are criticizing. And then just run the numbers. Do that uh, augmented reality joint. Use your whiz bang and drop how much they got paid to build this thing in the first place. I think I just invented a new form of journalism. You're welcome. Listen up. Uh, six minutes after 1900 hours here in Los Angeles. Highland Park represent. Nayla, I walked through my neighborhood today. The smoke has returned in some ways. And I hit up as many small businesses as I could. I went to a little snack shop and they I was all checked out. And uh, I looked over, I paid. And I turned around, they had toilet paper. Like, y'all got toilet paper? And I, I still, I still, whenever I see toilet paper, I gotta buy it. Cause you never know. With election season, 
I don't know what this present is up to. So get your toilet paper and read. I only bought four rolls, a small pack, a small pack. Got to save some for my neighbors. And then I went to the bike shop and I bought a sandwich. And then I went to the Latin joints and I was like, I'll be back because I want a huarache. So <laughs> I'm hungry. I'm tired. But y'all have helped and uh, we help each other. This is uh, Baratunde Thurston signing off my fourth stream of the day. Live on lockdown, episode 40, 24th of September, 2020. Make your plan. Claim your piece of this democracy. If they succeed in reducing your faith in this democracy, what they've really succeeded in doing is reducing your faith in each other. And we're all we've got. So lock arms virtually, safely, distantly with each other. And let's just crush this. Let's make the apocalyptic planning many of us are doing right now. Let's make it something we can laugh about. Remember when we were wondering how much cash we could take out and cozying up to our Canadian, Mexican, other American friends? Yo, that was crazy. Remember when we were afraid of Mitch McConnell? <laughs> Remember that? Remember that um, genital grabbing, tax dodging, philandering, family crime, family leading joke of an American. Do you remember? Remember, remember when we were so concerned with his tweets? What's he up to now? I don't even know. Last I heard, he was doing hard time working the fields down at Leavenworth. Unable to distract us from building our more perfect union, having gasped his last poisonous breath of our air. Let's create the world where we look back at this moment and say, whoo, that was, whew, oh boy, that was close. And we still got the climate crisis and we are gonna deal with that. And I'll talk about Uncle Elon maybe next week. What, a, what an interesting figure. Thank you for being with me. I love y'all. We got each other. We got to do this because I don't want to live in a world where we don't. I, I, I say I refuse to. So do your job. Do it. Don't leave any of your power on the field. Quoting Cheryl and Eiffel. Don't leave anything on the field. None of it. This is it. This is, this is it. All right, y'all. We out. I'll see y'all in the future, in the cloud, where we do this. Boop, 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 boop. This is me trying to find a, there's so many buttons to press to stop this. There's so, so, okay, that was one button. And uh, that's another button. And then uh, my IG fam, you get the last button. Dance with the ones that brung you. One more. <laughs> you export that.